WIW iRadio 76 proudly presents the 515 Show with your host, John Sarver. Who's at the 515 door today? Well, this is an easy one. I mean, it truly is. This is a story <clears throat> that that is um, months in making, or months in coming, I should say. Uh, and, and then normally what we do is we say that we, around the holidays, we kind of take us a little bit off of, of the drag racing thing, and we focus on folks, you know, like with from Pies and uh, Hilltop Pies and uh, the folks from the L.A. Cafe and Three Rivers. Michigan, everybody's got a good story. This is a story that this gentleman and I have been talking about literally for months and months and months and months and months. And it was a matter of how could we do it to the biggest audience and when would be the best time. And so we told him, we said, if you can hang around for the holidays, this is going to be one of, we think, a very inspirational story. And it's like, okay, let's do it. And so we finally got everything all together. We have it on right now. And so, uh, Ron Youngblood, how are you? I'm doing great, John. How are you? <laughs> Welcome to one of the warmest days of the winter. Not out this way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good news, not out anyway. All right. So, now here's the story. Everybody knows on CKWR Radio 76, Ron Youngblood, when he used to work over there, by our fine friends on the township board for where Milan Dragway sits right now and all the craziness that went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, Ron is now no longer in that position, and he is now in the same position but in Detroit. Talk about your big move up. Well, not necessarily the same, but very similar. All right, we'll take very similar. Yeah. All right, so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> fighting crime where you can find it, Batman. All right. Well, plenty of it. So, now here's the big scoop of real. We have talked, there is like zero tolerance for any kind of uh, bovine scatology and any kind of uh, tomfoolery. And you kind of wonder how Ron came to that situation now. Here's the story. Everybody knows Ron as, you know, the guy that's been on our video, like we said, and many, many times answering questions extremely to the point and with the facts behind them. And that's why we enjoyed him having on. But wait till you hear this story coming up way before this. I mean, everything happened in this story, Ron, that we're alluding to. How old were you when all this stuff started? 25, 26. And how old are you now? 21. How old? 41. Holy crap, you don't look 41. All right. Hey, that's the young blood. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Ron has has a beautiful daughter, just born just uh, this summer, right? Uh, Yeah, September 5th. She just turned three months on Friday, was it? Friday, whatever day the... Gosh. Now that she's here, it all goes by so fast. But yeah, December 5th, she turned three months. And so she's running by now, right? Oh, no, she's <laughs> advancing pretty fast, but she's definitely building up them lungs because she's downstairs screaming right now. Ah, yay, and who's with her? The mama. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> See, if it wasn't for her, man, the, the, her mom's just wonderful. Great. It's a different ball game being a dad, ain't it? You ain't kidding. It changed. <laughs> I thought everything changed as, you know, is when we touch on where we were and where I am now, I thought things started to change slowly no. over the years. But the moment they laid this baby on uh, my wife's chest, her mom's chest, oh, boy, it was, I don't want to say it's like a rebirth at a birthing, but it, it changed everything really fast. Yeah, because now everything, A, isn't like leave it to beaver. <laughs> you know, Not at all. In- oh, God. 30 minutes, the kid's quiet, and you get a full eight hours sleep, and, you know, now you're really looking. Now you look for a little bit longer when the car is, you know, at a stoplight, you know, Mm -hmm. and now you look, I mean, that whole deal of, I mean, how does fatherhood, I guess, I shan't say change you because you, you don't change, but how did it modify some of the stuff that you used to do to now you don't or you do better? Uh, well, I, the biggest thing I can think of is I'm fat, so I don't want her, <laughs> I don't want her to pick up on them habits. 
so I'm very aware of what and how much I eat, especially when she's got those little eyes on me. So that's one. Um, I quit drinking entirely. Wow. Um, I used to like my bourbon and enjoy that, but I'm like, well, that extra money, if you calculate over the, on an average of what you're drinking over a lifespan, you know, that becomes a significant amount of money, and life's not guaranteed, you know what I mean? Our, our next day's not really guaranteed, so I was yeah. like, well, that extra 15 bucks could be hers. So that's one, and I'm aware a lot of my own bullsh BS, <laughs> bovine scat, as you said. Yeah. So I have to, I put a lot of my thoughts and what I say through a filter. Even more so now, you know, with cancel culture, but now you got a baby that you don't want her to cancel you by her, her future decisions, right? Yeah. So I'm fully more aware, and like you said, extra time at a stoplight, it's like extra time with everything. Yeah, and it's amazing, I mean, down back to the bourbon thing, I mean, when did you buy your last pair of socks, and when was the last time you bought her? <laughs> <laughs> they seem to go through clothes rather quickly. Oh, the baby? Yeah. Well, my last bottle of bourbon was, I don't even think she was born yet. Wow. And then, was that a real, real question about the pair of socks? Or you yeah, well, of? It, it's almost to the point <laughs> where you think, all right, how much of these diapers cost? All right, I bought a box. This should last us a month. No. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got very lucky. We had a very successful, very successful baby shower to where we had to go use uh, the baby's grandmother's garage for extra space to store wow. the stuff in. Wow. So we're still running through gift diapers. However, the formula, the man. Yeah. That, that Quite a bit. I, I When people thought babies were expensive, I was like, ah, oh, no, no, they're not. And I know where it comes from. It's the amount of food. And then it'll eventually it'll be the diapers because we've only bought one box of diapers. We ran out of newborns. Out of three one months, box. that's damned impressive, son. Oh yeah. Well, she was born runty. She's kind of a runt. She's only six pound, twelve ounces, and kind of short. So she stayed what? a newborn. Until pre- oh yeah. We've had hamburgers bigger than that. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking, <laughs> looking, at, looking at my big ass and the mama. I'm like, you come out like that, and uh, is, is she really fine? Is that the skinny guys? What happened? <laughs> you know, I was born big. The mama was born big. Well, I don't want to be like big, I mean, eight pounds, and here comes a six-pound baby. We're like, uh, okay, well, you'll be a newborn for a while, which saves some money. Yeah. We thought, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, just because they're smaller, don't make them cheaper. You know? Well, you're right. Thankfully, the uh, like I we're referencing the baby shower and the amount of gifts we got. Yeah. Um, they, we had more. They, they bought more ones and twos and threes than they did newborns. So that was the only one we uh, had to buy was the newborn. But no, if we had to buy them, man, yeah, yeah, it'd have been a difference. Good yeah, we got a new job because that get that would be expensive. And don't you look at dads now that have four or five kids in tow, and you go, "How the hell you do it?" You know, tip of the hat, son. Yeah, uh, we we were somewhere the other day, and uh, no, we went to get pictures with Santa. Ooh. And uh, this guy and the wife, and you know, great looking, beautiful family sitting there, and she, my wife looks back and she goes, "That reminds me of my boss and his five kids." And then it caught my attention. And I'm like, five kids, are you dropping a hint? Oh, God, once a month. And I started you know, freaking out like this guy. How do you do it? Mom looks exhausted. Dad looks tired. And I'm like, oh, gosh. I can't imagine. You know, I, I wanted three. But now I'm like, well, yeah. I think two, two, two. Yeah. And so now we're like in hostage negotiations. Is it three, is it two? What if I just want as many as I want? And I'm like, oh, Lord, I better yeah. keep the job. Well, yeah. Don't get away. But. Yeah, I was going to say, and. <laughs> <laughs> when you hit that lotto, yeah, you can do it. But I mean, it, it, it's phenomenal when you see, like, back in the fifties and sixties and forties, when people had fourteen, fifteen kids, you know, and you went, "How the hell did you do?" Oh, yeah. Anyways, I, I mean, now that you have to look and, and quote unquote mind your p's and q's and all that stuff, back when you didn't have to, you know, because there was a, you kind of burst on the scene. Globally, and I'm using the air quotes, uh, this spring. I mean, this is where everybody picked up your life, st- or your life story, you know, in spring. And, and here's Ron, and he knows a lot about what he does, and he's no nonsense about it, and that's how it is. And that's kind of cool because when you go to you, you know that you're getting it not only right from the source, but you're getting the real deal. You're not getting the filtered version. You're not getting the slanted towards you version. You don't get the politic version. You get the version, you know. But yet, before all this, to get to the point to where you were, 
I mean, everything was okay, and then things kind of went a little bit to the left earlier in your life, right? Oh, yeah, very well. I would probably say a little more right. far right. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I should have said up or down or whatever. Because when you say left and right now, it's got the yeah, yeah, it's got the connotation. But yeah, well, I, I knew mean, what you meant. Yeah, I definitely knew. But I, yeah, I figured I'd throw that in there about a little extremely far right. Job well done. I mean, how did you get on this train? The train to go to the far right destination, or the train to yeah. get out of that. Um, yeah, I mean, really, let's start from the very beginning. See, what's happening is that Ron's got, this is an interesting thing, because we talked about this off mic a couple of months ago. I mean, there's going to be something, some way that, that the baby is going to go up in the attic and see some some papers from Dad, about Dad, mm-hmm. and go, um, is this you? You know? Oh, and yeah. Now, as now that you're looking at it as a dad, how do you explain this story? And it's not a story that we want to tap dance around. We're just setting it up yeah. so you understand what's what's coming along. Okay, so here's Ron going through life. He's got through sixth grade. Everything is bouncing. And now things start taking a little bit of a turn. I'm thinking. Well, when it comes down to the baby knowing, I think I'm going to save this recording, this, this, uh, this cast, and I'll make sure to play it for her on her fifth birthday. No, I'm just kidding. I don't well, know. we could use the ratings. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, always, I used to joke with people and say, um, although it's not necessarily a joking matter. Yeah. I told them I took two, two 18 credit semesters back to back, got burnt out, which I did. Made the dean's list. That's about the only positive side of that. Uh, got really drunk at a Judas Priest concert and woke up one day and didn't know who I was. Um, that's the silly condensed version. But I woke up. One day in May of 2006, extremely depressed. Uh, truly didn't really know what was going on in life, what made me happy, and got into it extremes, and eventually that really super-duper far-right, white supremacist ideology was it. How old were you at this time? Oh, uh, that, that was 2000, May of 2006. I'd have been 25 years old. <laughs> you had to, like, start counting on your fingers. You took yeah, two just, you 18, know, 18 credit semesters? Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, where at? You don't oh, have to say. Washington Community College. Okay. That's so Which is wow. a great college, by the way. I want to plug them. They're, they're awesome. Go right ahead. Yeah, great college. Great relationship with the professors, smaller classrooms, intimate. Perfect. All right. So 18 credit hours, and we're sailing at 25 years old here. Yep. Okay. Here comes 26. Well, it was the right in the month I turned 26. Um, everything kind of came to a head with the wrong group of people who were my, they were, one of them was family, younger than me, uh, spouted off a lot of stupid shit. Um, and eventually I latched onto that and stuff I was seeing from my, uh, within my peer group and other areas and yeah, ended up starting my own little skinhead faction and, um, regretfully committed a racially motivated act that, uh, took three years of my life. Wow. Okay. How deep you want to go with that? Oh, I, I told you in the message, I trust you to answer it and dig as much as you want. Um, I'm open and transparent. The end of the, It's the end of the story that makes me not yeah. afraid or ashamed to say what's in the chapters before the ending. Yeah, because you know what, I mean? what we have to do is, evidently, if you can read between the lines, the uh, Ron did something that ended up in not a nice uh, hotel that he had to go to. <laughs> no, not at all. No, it, it was an unfortunate hotel to be into, fine listener. And let's just say he didn't have big screen TV and a wraparound couch. Nope. We and, did have a couch, but it was in the chapel, and it was near an air conditioner. Yeah. And it was the best thing ever. <laughs> I mean, when, when you had to go in there, you know, and you had to go through the whole court system and all that stuff... Did anything start to dislodge in your brain and go, oh, maybe this isn't the world's best idea for me to be here? Or were you still thinking, okay, you know what, I'm still rough and tough, I can take this, and then come out even rougher? No, I was, for lack of a better phrase, a big pussy. <laughs> um, sorry if that offends sensitive ears that are listening in Norway and Sweden. <laughs> yeah, really, the, the but, Morocco uh, people, yeah. That's That was the truth, Um the toughness that I felt in the, in the actions I was doing was a big bravado. It was something that was comforting, but it really wasn't me. Hindsight 2020. Um, mm-hmm. After the act was done, 
Um, it's almost like I woke up and I realized that it's something horribly stupid. Um, and cause I wasn't born racist. Nobody's born racist. These were a series of learned behaviors that started off. And I, I blame the, the, the initial seeds of that racism and hatred being planted from the media at a young age. Um, back in the eighties, it's a lot different than now, as far as what we're seeing on shown on TV shows and newscasts, right? Yeah, right. Um, a lot different. I think most people our age and, and older may, may see that if they're, you know, paying attention. Um, so it was a, a whole lot of time of things just festering and brewing that exploded into such an extreme because it finally got noticed. The angers, the hatreds, and the animosities were finally programmed into something chaotic and sad and, and, and terrible. So at that time, I realized, well, I did this. I know there was a consequence. I knew there was a consequence coming. So I just tried to avoid the consequence i went off went to thought i could find a balance between how i felt the things i learned to know in regards to to that nationalism extreme nationalism and that supremacy and try to have a functioning life in society and it just there you can't meld the two the two don't mix being a functioning a good functioning member of society with them ideologies don't mix um so i went to a truck driving school thinking that i'd be off on the road and they'd never find me like, I'd never be, I'll, be I'll, I'll always be gone. Nobody will ever get me. And it was July 10th of 2006 that I realized that was horribly wrong. And that's when it all came came falling down. There was no comfort. There was no escape, only consequence. Yeah, that's kind of weird when they finally catch up with you. I mean, some of the world's greatest laid plans, and you, when you think, and, and I use greatest in quotes, you know, when you think, I, I can beat this. You know, I, I, I can. This will be my escape route. I'll disappear. I'll just be a you know name in the crowd, and away you go. Except for when you go for driving school, they kind of want to know your name and social security number. Run that. Oh, look who we got here. Yeah. Well, luckily, no charges were filed just yet when I registered for the trucking school. Although I was open with the guy of what was going on in life because I didn't want it to upset their establishment with what they were doing. Um, they asked, "Well, you know, that is pretty." heavy thing where are you at now and i just said i'm trying my best um so i think they they they, they got their money <laughs> right they got their money knowing that if, when it came to a head that there's no way i'd be able to leave the state there's no way i'd be able to, to fulfill my end of the bargain and when i realized that and i quit lying to myself i sat down with the person in charge of intake and i said look this is the deal and they still got their money and i got nothing out of it but i was a man about it and said, hey, I'm not going to fake it. This is what's happening in life, and this is really the truth of what's going on. And it's probably best if I just stop right here. And they shook hands and said wish, they wished me luck, and that was it. Well, Ron, what at 25 clicks in your brain that says, not only are we going to go skinhead, because skinhead was back in the 80s, 90s, mm-hmm. you know, was uh, oopsie-daisy kind of folks. These are not folks that you would bring in for a tea you know, I mean, these were everything that you saw. England probably had a, a little bit different version of what a skinhead was. But here in America, you want to see the term neo-Nazi, drop by, say hi. You know, if you want to see something where you just want to upend things, to upend things and kind of really lean on folks, this is kind of where you're going with the skinhead time at that time. How far close am I, Ron? Um. If I understood you correctly, I think you're pretty close. Yeah. Um, it was it was a big rebellion of myself, and it was a big revolution in terms of I wanted to be noticed. You know, I did not want to be noticed. I had the bald head, wore certain attire that was reminiscent of them. So did the people in this little clique. Um, we were pretty arrogant. We wanted to be, you know, upset everybody. Every, every, everybody. You know, there wasn't a time where we weren't together or I wasn't where I looked mean and was just angry. Just angry. Um, and as far as what just clicked to make it that, I, it was just a perfect storm, you know, an uh, imperfectly perfect storm. It's when all things, you know, you, you'll never drop all the material from a helicopter to build a house and miraculously have a house. But you can drop every situation and experience throughout the course of a life into one perfectly imperfect moment where things just, they happen. Um, and so as far as where, when it when and where, I, I, it was a slow progression. You know, I can look back now and go, oh, yeah, I can see how that situation and how I handle it really led to that next move that was not the best choice. But at the time, things just moved so fast. And when you're angry and depressed and pissed off and 
you look at other people that have a certain image and an ideology and they're angry, depressed, and pissed off. You're like, man, that must be my, that they must be my people. That must be my group, you know? Yeah. And as far as where, the, you know, the you said something about the 80s, you know, once you're in that mindset and you, there's law enforcement that you would never think that have that ideology and live that way. They just don't have the Doc Martens, the bomber jacket, and the red laces and their black boots. Um so they're not just as visible, but I mean, if it's written on their heart, to 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 hell with how the it looks on the outside. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just thinking, where did all this? This was done. What all down river? I mean, where were you when you were the head of your group? Well, um, it was it was Wayne County area for the sake of the other people involved. Okay. I yeah, don't want to cool. give up. I mean, you could Google it, right, and, yeah. and get the idea, but. Um, I'll have to practice a little bit of uh, refrain on that one. Okay. Because I'm thinking you were nowhere near the northern suburbs, you know. I mean, especially, no, no, I mean, how big of a group were you the capo of? Uh, four. <laughs> <laughs> I only laugh only because you see sometimes these groups are, are in the hundreds. You know, but that's okay. Four, you know. Well, you know, and it's it's. I'm glad. I don't want to say I'm glad them circumstances happened. However, if they didn't happen, I might not be as content and happy and loving and caring. And not only that, loving myself as I sit here today, right? Um, this whole thing we're talking May of '06. Yeah, I might have said '05. It was May of '06, and it was the act was done in June of '06. And you get busted July of 06. So it was only a three, what, May to July, a two-month period where this thing from the point of this is who I am, this is what we are, this is how and what we're going to do and live, and the federal government saying, like, hell, you are. So it wasn't something where, you know, you're in high school and you're walking the halls and secretly saying racial slurs to your friends. It wasn't nothing like that because that, that wasn't who I was. I wasn't that kid. You know, my first friends as a child were black children, right? And my first... uh teachers that had an impact especially in that moment prior to le leading up to the moments where you totally just don't care anymore and you forget it and then after the fact they have some of the best people and teachers and most impactful have been african americans or black right minorities mm -hmm. and so that's not who i was um even through college i had great relationships with my my instructors and professors that were black you know to the point of if I was sick and dealing with something, I don't worry about homework. You do great. You got great. You you always attend, and we always had a great relationship. Christmas greetings out of out of class, and after you're done being their student, and those relationships, and I let all that and sacrificed all that for some stupid moments and hatred. But it's not who I was. The whole that whole most affecting on my reputation and most guiding moment come from that little three month of building actual although the seeds were planted a long time ago i really believe that that flower only bloomed in may of 06 and was chopped down in july of 06 so when you did the act and i'm doing the air quotes king mm -hmm. i mean was it something premeditated or were you just in the moment and then you look left and looked right and said you know what i'll lead this i'll show everybody how tough i am yeah one of the uh i'll say co-conspirators Brought this, brought doing this thing up for gosh, two, three weeks, four weeks, continuously. And it's like, no, nah, I don't want nothing to do with that. No, that's not how we are. No, no, no. You know, and then eventually it was one moment. We were all together in a situation, and actually at a restaurant. I can remember it very clearly. And all we were, we were surrounded by diversity. Diversity of skin color, diversity of language, diversity of uh, lineage or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And it was loud, and it was loud. It's like I couldn't even hear myself think. And it wasn't loud. In an, in an ambiance where it's just loud and noisy. Everything in that moment, I was surrounded by everything in, the, in that little time period I've grown to not like and hate. And so I looked at him and I said, you know what, let's do that. And they were excited. And he was excited. He finally got what he wanted. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. So it was a spontaneous. The night it was done, it was, I think it was, the sun wasn't even, it was about 7 p.m. So it was right when you tell the evening's coming. And it was done within a five-hour period. So how did they find, I mean, if if it took them a month and a half to apprehend you, you know, mm -hmm. then why 
why was there a time gap here? Um, well, it was done on June 19th, the act, in air quotes, mm-hmm. uh, was June 19th. And I had no idea the significance of June 19th, which is the day the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. <laughs> I had no idea until after the fact. I had right. no idea. So I added a bit more shame to the fact that now it's a holiday I get off and I celebrate, right? Mm-hmm. For, for obvious reasons. Uh, it changed uh, atrocious history. You know, you, the Emancipation Proclamation was a good thing. True. But in that moment, I spit on our, I spit on our history and that history. You know, I spit on, and I didn't even realize it. It was that day, and I, maybe I would have thought twice. And I probably wouldn't have thought twice. But yeah, it was June nineteenth was the act. July tenth was the day. The feds don't. When the feds got you, they don't have to rush. <laughs> you know, when they, unless you're, you know. Um, the Boston bomber or somebody like that. When the feds got you, they don't have to rush. I mean, did you know that they were on your tail? Or that, you know, because, I mean, that's a little bit of time in between there. I mean, did you think that, you well, we got away with it? Or maybe it'll cool off, maybe people forget? Oh, yeah. You know, um, now I say the feds don't have to rush. But then I'm like, if they had us or had anything, we'd have done been busted. So, you know, you go off to truck driving school. You start trying to find a way with what you did and. I got a call one day, uh, well, July 10th, I got a call from the one, the co-conspirator's girlfriend saying that the township police and some other guy was at his house and took him off to jail. And that's when my stomach dropped and sank and I realized I was even in more trouble than when I, when we did it. Wow. So, yeah, six, six weeks. And then. Afterwards, they get you, they interrogate you, they build, a str- they build a case, they build a very strong case. They talk to you, they talk to your family, they talk to friends, they talk to people that still still won't talk to me, which I respect. You know, I'm not going to push the envelope. I hurt them, and mm-hmm. I can respect that. And and maybe one day I can hug and say sorry. But anyway, anyhow, um, yeah, that was June, uh, August of 17 before the charges came. So even oh, the 13 months, yeah, they take your time. And it, there wasn't a very comforting 13 months. It was the worst. That was probably one of the – that whole leading up to period might have been worse than being incarcerated. Well, I mean, it's a, it's amazing. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we're not dealing with, with the uh, Wayne County sheriffs here. We're talking a couple of steps above them, aren't we? Yes. All right. So now if you did something that got – because everybody and their brother on their screens going, what the hell did he do? <laughs> okay, well, stay well, tuned for part two. You know, go at your own speed. But I mean, what ha- here's the story. I mean, deduce what happened here, friends. I mean, you don't have to go really deep between the lines. You know, I mean, you can get the basic outline of what went on. If the fi- if a skinhead did something <laughs> in a restaurant, and they built thirteen months to have a federal case to put this gentleman in prison for a couple of years out of his life, he just didn't go by somebody and go, you know what, I don't like your hat, and walked by. You know, it was probably something a lot deeper, and clearly it was. The feds don't get involved if it's lightweight. No, they don't. Um, The feds deserved. I deserved them to get involved. The country and the taxpayers who put their faith in that enforcement body definitely deserved them to get involved. Um, and when a cross gets burned in front of a biracial family's house, um, they should be involved. And that's exactly what we did. And, yeah, they got involved. Wow. And they, <laughs> and back then they didn't play. They don't play now. But, I mean. No, you know, I've always, and sorry to interrupt you, but you no, know, I look at the way things are now and I go, you know, had, you know, and I see acts of hate that happen now, I get sad. You know, I can say because I understand what it, what it feels like to be trapped in that ideology and hurt people. You know what I mean? I really understand. And I'm glad justice gets served in most of these cases. You know, I truly am. I was glad justice was served in mine. Had it not, I wouldn't be here today. I know that. I would have probably been dead or hurt, hurt people beyond what I did in that event. Um, but, yeah, no, the, the punishment should be severe, and it just seems like we don't learn as a society. And when these things keep happening, then, yeah, they, they definitely should come down on them. I mean, when you had the feds there and you had to go to court and do the sentencing and the arraignments and all that fun stuff, I mean, whatever lawyer you had representing you, if any, if at all, I mean, you just try to get a plea? 
I mean, it's it's a strange mechanic to go through. Yeah, um, I told him that I was honest. This is what I'd done. You know, I, I did everything I could to make a statement, which attorneys have. I started asking attorneys and calling attorneys after the first interrogation when they're when I in July after the first one. Okay, and they uh, they they asked, "Oh, you're that guy, twenty grand." And I didn't have that. I didn't have nothing. I was a poor student. Uh, my work ethic was crap. I was going through a lot emotionally, so I didn't have a job. And then I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to get a court-appointed attorney who's going to just sell me to the feds, and I'm going to lose the rest of my life, and this is what I deserve. And I didn't have that kind of an attorney. I had an attorney who actually fought for the truth and did his best to get a, 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 a Jew- justice. He was a Jewish guy. So at the time, I'm like, oh, you give me a Jewish guy, and I'm still dealing with them emotions and hatreds and animosities, and I'm trying not to, I'm trying not to, and I'm trying not to be that person. But I, I asked him, and we had conversations, and to to this day, if we see each other, it, it's it's a good it's a good encounter, right? But he fought and he did right, and I feel he did what he should, and I felt he was a great attorney. And um, was I bummed out at 36 months in federal prison? Yes but it's what I deserved. And then he says, he said the same thing. He goes, the people, there's a certain branch of the feds that wanted more time. Two, two different branches. And he, uh, he two he different fought. branches. Well, yeah, the, uh, civil rights division of the justice department gets involved in these things, which they should. Um, cause not only are they watching what's going on with what you've done, they're watching other agencies that are handling it. Right. So they were involved in the probation department wanted five years and the civil rights division was pushing for quite a bit more and uh with the plea deal and the prosecutor's office they come down to the confession which i gave the first day in july and i had no problem giving um it's about accountability and so i got 36 months and in the feds the good time's already given you lose it so i ended up doing 32 and then six months in a community confinement in the city of detroit Wow, I, so, I, it's almost time to process all that. Holy crap. And you were how old at the time that you went in? Uh, it was 2000. They don't move they don't move quick. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, unless you're like, you know, the Boston bomber, but yeah. I went in Jul- January 30th of 2008, so I was 27. So man, you were just like dangling on a on a rope so to speak uh for 2 years for or 13 months. Yes. You know, it's like every, you know, the, every time the phone rings, every time the door knocks, you know, can you start yeah, a life? It, it, yeah, you, you really can't enjoy life that way because you're, you're <laughs> checking the blinds like you're on crack, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you're, you're right. Yeah. You're, 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 you're like every noise, you're like, oh, God, it's them. What, are, what did they miss? Are they coming to find something else? And you, it really drains your adrenal glands. And it's almost, I'm sitting here now in my house and I'm going, I don't check the windows no more. Doors don't bother me here, and I'm getting knocked on. The phone rings. As long as it's not the boss, I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> and I think back to then, and I'm like, it's like, it's like a PTSD. And uh, it's like, ooh, now I'm sitting here getting nervous again. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's not a good experience. It's not good. It's it's If I could have learned and have what I have today by going maybe a harder labor path versus a big mistake path, you know, maybe get shot in the leg, something like that, gosh, that, that might have been a trade-off, but... It's, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, well, it's kind of amazing that, I mean, here's this, you know, if you're going to be a skinhead and you're going to be a leader of a skinhead, and you're not a small guy whatsoever. I mean, nobody would ever expect, you know, confuse you with Barney Fife on Mayberry RFD. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you're a pretty big, pretty intimidating looking guy, and I bet you when you squint, you really look intimidating. And back then, if you had all the skinhead stuff, which people were, you know, just the normal human being looking by going, ooh, it's a tough-looking cookie there. I mean, how do you confess right away when you're, you know, putting off this, look how tough I am, look what I just did, look at this cross I just burnt, look at all this stuff, and, uh, yeah, that's right, I did it. Normally, it's like, oh, hell no, you can't get nothing out of me, copper. I mean, why the quick confession? I mean, it was cool. It was good that you did that, but normally you don't come, I mean, a person doesn't come down that fast. Well, the first night... I spent, not even the night, the first, when they got me, it was about 8 o'clock, 8.30 on the 10th of July, in the little township that it happened in, they put me in their little cell, they said they'd give me water, they didn't, it was a cold bed, cold cold concrete slab, almost looked like uh, a dog kennel, 
Mm. The blanket was an Afghan, like, like it had knits, it had holes all in it, which probably somebody else used for three nights while sweating their uh, drunk off. Candy. Um, and it was just nasty. And when I sat across from these guys and, and well, the, the federal agent and the, the township um, official, and their line of questioning, I there's no, you, you really screwed up. You know, you, I knew I screwed up, bef- I knew I screwed up once I did it. I knew I screwed up, like I said, it's almost as if I, I woke up. I knew I screwed up. So once they hit, once there, it was there, I, I didn't have the money to fight it. I didn't have the will to fight it. And I didn't have the good conscience to feel I was innocent to fight it. I was always told that if you do something wrong, you'd be a man, you'd be accountable. And I knew I did wrong. At the time, I knew I was doing wrong, but I couldn't stop it. And then after they sit you down and you're like, well, you know, what do you do? You, you tell them, you know, I feel I told them everything I could. And then they want more details to support what I told them. And yeah, I told them everything that I could. I had no problem. Well, I did have a problem with it because you still, you, you piss some people off. Mm. But, you know, it was at that point it come down to my life in hanging on to a dead idea that I knew, and as more time went on after the fact, um, even in a short period of time, it's a dead idea, and it's a di- dead ideology, right? I wasn't going to go, I didn't want to go down for that. I felt that I went down for, for having some um, accountability, you know? If I was going to go down, I was going to go down honest and say exactly what I did. Did anybody else in, in the fine friends that were with you, because I'm sure you just sit and pop out of the minivan and start burning crosses and then split, I mean, did anybody else with you go down? Yeah, one other. Yeah, one, one of the other, one of the other co-conspirators. The other two were younger. Mm. You know, so it's and I'm glad it was all my fault. I take full responsibility for it. Um, age difference or not, they were uh, early to mid teens. Wow. And they were friends with the, he was a relative, um, and they they were kind of his buddies, and they were all involved and. Early yeah, so teens, got, and you were 25? Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Wow, what in your early teens would tick you off so much that you would want to join this? Uh, I think, without psychoanalyzing it, and, and no, trying, don't. I don't want it to sound like I'm putting any of the response. I take full responsibility for it. I always have. I always will. Sure. Um, I, I, it's my fault. You know, um, as far as that, I don't know. I don't want to say home life or the peer pressure of the other person involved who had the, they were all from the same town, same school, same wow. kind of upbringing, you know. So I think that little bit of that involvement and pressure and, you know, it's like I said, there's, you'd be surprised where those beasts and demons lay that have that idea out. You'd be very surprised. Yeah, well, <laughs> believe me, we ran into some of that. Um, now with those other Three, I guess, three guys, or how many other people that were with you? I mean, of that group, because we're going to come back to you, but of that group right now, are they still kind of going through that stuff, or did they all go, geez, what a stupid time in our life? And, well, last, yeah, no, I know where you're going. Last yeah. I knew, one stayed on the fence. You know, it was still rebel flags or heritage, and I'm, I'm no, they're not. Um, that's kind of how he is, and the other two, I, why we have zero contact. Even the one that's kind of family memberish, we don't have no contact. Um, it's better that way. Yeah. And yeah. I, I I truly hope not. You know, I truly hope that the situation, even though the other ones kind of got, they 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 had it more easy. You know, they didn't have anything on their permanent record. Right. Um, I truly really hope the experience was enough to say, you know what, let me not do that ever again, and let me work on me, and not do that ever again. So another guy went to jail too, right? Correct. And he's, I guess, in his early 40s, late 30s, and he's still thinking about doing this stuff? Um, from what I heard from other close friends, he did stuff like that to kind of brag and boast about it. It was a more of an identity thing. Hey, I've been down. I'm a convict. <laughs> you know? And that's not what you want to brag and boast about. And, yeah, there's, he, there's still an attachment. It's like a, yeah, I don't know. Wow. Why? That's, I mean, that's hardcore. Hand, on, on third-hand information from somebody that I would say is, you know, at least... Credible? Well, yeah. And I don't know how long ago these things took place. Um, I don't know what they're doing in life now. Um, I truly hope they're all really learned and successful. Um, and life's blessed them. 
But yeah, the other one was that's how it was. Wow. Still, and, still kind of on the far right side. Well, see, that's what I'm saying. That's kind of weird because you would think th- that, you know, going to the Grey Lady isn't the most fun time to spend years of your life, especially young. And you go, oh, my God, what you're supposed to do and what society says is that you're going to look back at those prison years and go, I never, <laughs> ever want to return to this place again. And I'm going to tell all my friends this place sucks because it isn't prison like you see on TV, like on Barney Miller or something, some kind of, you know, sitcom mm-hmm. where where the town drunk lets himself in and passes off. You know, it, it's not a pleasant experience. And that's for another time down the road but now to bring it back forward okay so now you're out of prison you know now that you have you know a felony that long on your arm right now now how do you start over thank you for your Um, time goodbye now see the real world yeah that's kind of how it was um i used it's different i wasn't like typical inmates convicts felons however you want to say it Although, once you have a number, once you have the crime, once you have it on your record, it, a lot, it's really hard for pe- a lot of people to see past that, and it's a really uphill climb. Um, fortunately, I, I was in Detroit. They put me in the halfway house for six months, and there you had to work. You had to get a job. It was still coming off of the 2008 recession, so there was not mm. a whole lot out there for work. So, that, you know, we were encouraged to go to school. Um, and not only do the, 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 the lot of experiences, as you said, from the gray lady, that uh, laid a good foundation for coming home. Um, if it wasn't for the black and brown brothers of the inmate church, I would have probably dead or reoffended. They loved me and cared for me regardless of what I did, um, no matter what kind of day I had that um, or what I was struggling with. They were there. And I don't want to say, I'll say it in air quotes, my people, people of a, at the time kind of a like mind, um, or where I figured my big bald ass with the tattoos would have been gobbled up by some type of Aryan thing, that never happened. I was alone for a little bit, and then it was his name was Rick. I won't say his last name. Mm. He kind of talked like Sylvester the Cat. <laughs> One day in January, I'm walking down the hall, and he, this black guy comes up to me, and he starts talking. Hey, brother, how you doing? And I'm like, oh, God, he's going to sell me on something. He's, he's wanting something. You see all them horror stories in prison? This mm-hmm. ain't going to end well. He, he sees me sad. He's going to pounce on me. They say don't show emotion. And uh, he asked how my day was. I said, well, I think it sucks. And he asked why. And I gave him the dumbest look as we're walking through all these gray bricks in this tiny hallway, Mm -hmm. the cells. And I said, "Uh, well, because we're in prison, (laughs) it sucks. (laughs) And I'm, you know, tearing up and I'm mad. And he goes, oh, there ain't nothing to be sad about, brother. Let me come here and let me show you something. So he puts his hand up and he starts to walk faster. Like, come on, come on. Walk into the two-man cells and it's Fort Dix. Uh, McGuire Air Force Base, it's the federal prison there. And so they had two-man cells in the general population area. So he, he, we, I reluctantly went, but I'm glad I did, because he opened a locker, and where I thought he was going to shank me, he pulled out a Bible. And he pulled out this Bible that he he had been, you know, he was in there for a crack charge. For the last six years, he was involved in the church and reading the scriptures and Bible studies and you name it. So immediately, he starts giving me scriptures, starts feeding me spiritually, starts doing all these kind of things, and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, do you know why I'm here? And so I asked him, I said, why are you doing this? He goes, because everybody needs love. And I, I, I can remember that vividly. And it was that moment where things, they wouldn't let me go. These, these, these uh, believers wouldn't let me go. These black and brown brothers of the church, and I mean Hispanics. There's even some of the Muslim church, um, or not the Muslim church, the mosque, <laughs> looked out for me, no matter what, no matter what I looked like when they found out what I did, they never left me alone. If I felt like, if they thought I was straying, they always come back and said, hey man, what's what's going on? You seem a little, you'll be hanging out with this group that looks pretty questionable right now. What's going on, man? And I can never, ever forget or not honor um, them for what they did. So that love, and that went on for three years. Um, I played ch- uh, bass in the church choir. They wanted me because I was a bass player. Um, they always said I had the rhythm of a black man. <laughs> so they wanted me. Um, so I did a little singing with them, too. Built a lot of great relationships. And they they loved me more than anybody. And I'm not talking prison love to be a little funny. I'm talking... No, no, yeah. I'm talking because that never happened. Well, I mean, it happened, but not to me, thankfully. 
sad it happened to them. But that part stayed pretty. That was good. So. Yeah, but you're you're. You know, I was going to say you're a pretty big guy, but yeah, I'm know, not sexy. I'm not prison sexy. <laughs> I'm not desperate sexy. I'm I'm surprised my wife is hot because I'm not prison looking. sexy. Yeah. There's no amount yeah. of time in separation from a woman in a prison that would make a man want me. Mm. I thank God for being born ugly and big. But, <laughs> yeah, but um, lucky you. You're intimidating looking. You know. Well, I, I'm actually soft, but. Yeah, don't you tell know. folks that in prison. No, a lot of them knew it, <clears throat> but yeah. uh, they they never gave up. And then we're talking years of that that made the biggest difference with me. And so when I was in the city of Detroit, I was in a halfway house on Jefferson. And one day I, I was overwhelmed because I'm free, kind of free. If I go too far and don't come back in time, I'm no, I'm back. You know, the, they take all that away. Mm-hmm. So I was at the Rosa Parks bus station. And I was the only white guy within maybe one or 200 people. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching, and something's loud, like a loud voice. I don't want to say it's a voice of God. Maybe it's just my own conscience. But something said, just pay attention. And so I was nervous. I'm like, this is the first time, other than prison, I've actually been the only white person. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching. And I'm watching a grandmother with her, a presumed grandma uh, taking care of the kids, mm-hmm. yelling at them, doing what she's got to do to, to make sure they're safe. Um and there was this guy, he's a black guy, I'll never forget, he's wearing a brown long coat, like a trench coat, snazzy, real, real snazzy shoes, and there's these, uh, they say thuggish. They weren't like, they, yeah, they were big and intimidating, and they looked like um, thugs. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Mm-hmm. Walked by this guy with his business suit in his uh, suitcase, and this guy quickly took that suitcase, hugged it in front of him like he's hugging a dying relative, jumped out of the way, and shook. And I said to myself, we're no different. We may have different colors, different ways that we worship, different people we sleep with, different DNA of where we come from, but it, we're not different. And it was in that moment that the nail in the coffin of that old man was dead. And I had to just include that. I had to take that trajectory that direction. Um, I didn't want to totally miss the, the, the things, that, the love from prison and that experience going forward. Um, so I, if I took it out of your uh, trajectory, my apologies, mm. but... No, that, that's uh, fine. No, it's okay. Yeah, I, that, that 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 I they felt that really definitely had to be said. It, it rounds the story. That's fine. You know, so, okay, so you're there. You know, you're at the halfway house. Now you're out of the halfway house, mm-hmm. you know, and now you're how old? Uh, oh, 30. Okay, and now you go. 10, yeah, 30. Now you go, now what? Because really, one of the biggest, I mean, you weren't in there for like, Two decades or anything, but it's enough to disorientate you. You ain't kidding. Time is time. Yeah. And time without a woman and time without what you want to eat, time without your choice of a television show, you you find a way to work on you or suffer. And I worked on me. And it was still bad, but I got lucky again to the halfway house. The first person to give me a job was a black woman. And I'm proud to say her name. I'll never, she'd probably not listen <laughs> Oh, Her name was sure Jerome, is. and it, it, it was a Dollar Tree in off Jefferson near uh, Gross Point. And she says, you know what? I can respect the fact you're struggling. Hey, you got to eat, too. Can you start Monday? And I cried, and I'll never forget her for that. I was so content. I was doing what I was supposed to do um, with that big blurp and that big, terrible black spot on my reputation and history. Somebody took a chance and gave me a job. And I screwed up my financial aid at the WC3, Wayne County Community College trying to take classes to finish that associate's degree with the two 18 credits I got or 18, 218 credit semesters I got burnt out on and I told the lady at financial aid I said look I'm a re- they call them returning citizens in a progressive city nice. like, yeah. so I said I'm a returning citizen this is all I got if I don't make it she, she moved heaven and earth for me to get my financial aid I don't remember her name but I can remember her face and what she did for me you know and yeah, so I had them two things working in my favor. But after I finished the class I needed for the associate's degree, got the associate's degree, left the city of Detroit in the halfway house, then I can say, and sorry to take it from you again, then what? And that's when you're like, oh, God, the real world is big, and what do I do now? And, yeah, I don't know if I've ever talked to you this much, John. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you have. Anyways... All right, so now you're there, and now you got your job, and now somehow, some way, you land 
in this little teeny ass township. <laughs> yeah. How did that happen? Um, well, fast forward of a lot of hustling and struggling and all that to make it, I was a medical marijuana caregiver. Um, and I met a patient who was related to this big, tall, goofy looking guy who just got elected township supervisor, who I at the time highly respected, um, grown to highly respect and admire. And one day we were moving his relative from Redford Township to Belleville. And I heard him talking about a certain person, which I won't name because he's still in the township. Mm. And I said, you know what? I need a part-time job. I'm tired of this stuff. Go ahead and hire me. I'll do it. I'll, I'll take care of his problem. I, I got you. And I don't know if it was that or a halfway decent resume, but I applied and I actually got the damn job. <laughs> and the job <laughs> was? Zoning administrator and code enforcement officer. Yeah, man. But I know one thing that did help just to back up a few months. Sure. I, apply, I applied for two state licenses because I have a friend of mine who I highly admire, admire and respect. He's, he's a black man. Uh, stayed my friend throughout, never gave up on me either. And so when I got out, he had offered me a job, but I wasn't in a place to take it. And then later on, I met with him several years down the road, and we met at Pizza Hut. And I said, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm flipping houses, and I'm my own broker. I'm doing real estate. And so we talked about what he was making per month. And at that moment, I joined a school for real estate and uh, residential license builder. And I took those classes, passed the test, and the state has to deem you of good moral character to give you a license. So I had to submit paperwork from professionals and references, and the state deemed me of good moral character. For real estate? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Okay. They they may have missed some of those. Oh, yeah. Well, real estate involves housing. And then with with a crime like that, they could assume, hey, you're out to just redline or whatever. I can't remember the term now. Yeah. To to create white all white neighborhoods, you know. So they're very involved with backgrounds, just so they know who they're giving a license to, you know. And I had enough professionals and friends that I had made in that that long period. We didn't talk too much about from 2010 on that the state goes, hey, this guy's got all these diverse people to have in his back. He must have changed. Let's let's give him his license. Mm-hmm. So I think that really might have made the biggest difference with the township board down there is they saw this guy who, who, who had earned a second chance, was earning licenses, had ambition, showed some, some smarts. Let's give him the job. Yeah, it shows a lot of smarts, and, the, and that's one of the things that was uh, – it's, it's – um, I shan't say offsetting because it's it's not – but you expect, especially when people roll up on you, they don't expect you to be, to know. I mean, you're like a sponge when it comes to mentality. God, did you blow, you know, a decade out of your life? Because really, if you can know all these things, because we threw a lot of questions at you, you know, in the summertime and the springtime and stuff like that. And you were on the job for how long? Oh, at that time, I think we're going on almost three years. Yeah, Okay. Nobody knows that much in three years unless you're like a seasoned pro of doing that. Well, I mean, you, especially at a part-time, very part-time job. Very, you know, especially in, in a little podunk, you know, I shouldn't podunk, but in a small <laughs> community like that. You know, it's it's an amazing thing how you can raffle off, you know, ideas and, and, and laws, and this is the way it's going to be, and this is how it is. And there's yeah. no fudging, you know, paragraph three, section one, letter A. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody knows how to do that, Ron. I mean, it's fascinating that you did that for when you did. I mean, it's like how fast do you read when you look at a book, how much you retain, obviously, a lot. Yeah, yeah. I took a lot of classes to supplement what I was reading out of the ordinance book and the code books. Um, anywhere, anywhere you go, you should try to be the best you can at your job. And you can't, there's only so much effort in terms of labor and in terms of action that you can do. But you can do a lot more and you can do a lot more right and better the more you learn. Yeah. And I'm after, I'm pursuit, getting ready to pursue two or three other designations for the job I have now. And you, it's not required. I'm doing it so I'm better at it. You know what I mean? And not only that, it's, I always have that one big word that's always going to follow me. You know, I didn't get, I wasn't lucky enough to be Lil Wayne. Kwame Kilpatrick or any other one of uh, what Donald Trump's rich friends, right? Yeah. Um, my pardon is sitting on President Biden's desk now. Um, my hope 
he he sees what I, everybody else is seeing and goes ahead and gives the pardon. But you, we always have that when you're a felon and you you, you have that you've done time. You got to work harder than everybody else. You know, it, it's uh, it's disabling because people hear that they see that and they automatically go that oh my god you can't do we can't trust uh, you, you you hear that right so you have to have more where they go man you did what since 2010 you did what since you got out you ain't that person and so my every in- interaction with everybody has that in mind i don't want to be seen that way most people nine times well 99 percent of the time you you make a relationship you have friends you're building something positive and then you lay that on them and they go, dude, for real, I'd have never, never known. Had you told, no, if somebody would have told me that about you, I'd have called him a liar. Yeah. You know, that's easy to figure out. I've heard that so many times in the last going on 12 years that I'm proud of it, but it's something I never, the sadness of having that conviction never leaves. It's motivating but it's a sadness that never leaves because I know I hurt people and people will still be hurt by the fact that I did that. And it's something that I don't like to hurt people. Then at that time it was stupid and exciting and it was, Hey, notice me. And if you're going to notice me this way, then everybody's going to notice me. Now it's like, let's have a conversation other than just focusing on that. Ask who I am now or how I got here. You know, I, it's, I don't know if you got enough time to keep touching on all these topics. John. (laughs) No, we're running out of time, but it's fascinating to bring it back now to the forward. All right, so here we are walking almost into 2022. You're in the 18th largest city in America, depending on which demographic you take a look at, from going from a, a, a township that had less than, what, 1,000 people maybe? Oh, no, I think it was 2,900. Okay, three grand. Hell, there's some little parts in Wayne County that there is three grand. On a street, <laughs> a pretty oh, yeah. big street, you know. So you took a leap up in this. Okay, so now, evidently, they must love you over there because you're still there. Yeah. Well, um, I took a. I never thought that the city of Detroit would hire me. Um, I'm really even nervous mentioning their name. Mm-hmm. Um, for obvious reasons, although I was truthful on the application, and I got the emails to show I was truthful, um, discussed it in the Zoom meeting. The city of Detroit's a little more progressive, where I had my credentials and my experience, and even with the background check, they're like, this guy can't be that guy. Let's give him a chance. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm honored by it. You know, I told her, I had a conversation with a guy today at an auto shop, and I said, you know, Detroit's all of us, man. That's all our history. You know, it's not a white or black or brown thing. Detroit unites this part of Michigan. Mm-hmm. We got the we got the ball games. We got downtown. That's 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 everybody's hub. Detroit's all of us. And we were talking about keeping Detroit. You know, they were glad that they hired so many building inspectors. Detroit's really doing everything they can to right a lot of wrongs and, and keep things moving in the right direction. And we were having it was about that conversation. And he just said, "Thanks for doing the right thing and keeping you know helping keep it clean and get it clean." And, of course, somebody can't make, say them things without me just talking about how much I love the job and talking about love and, and, and doing the right thing. And, uh, yeah, it's intimidating to get back when you say the 18th largest going from that little tiny township. Um, I tell everybody my experience only matters in the amount of transferable skills and knowing how to read a code book because um, it's so large and there's so much more frequency. But it's an awesome place. It's an awesome place full of how I want the world to look, um, especially in my daughter's life as she grows up. Uh, and I'm not talking about the bad elements that the, like, the, the media likes to feed and, pr- and produce. I'm talking about the diversity. The You go into any restaurant, there's a whole bunch of people in there. They're chit-chatting. They're sharing a, a space and an environment and air from all different walks of life, and nobody's nobody's getting hurt. You know what I mean? They're not walking in there just to do racially motivated dumb things and go build off, go build podcasts on how they hate a certain specific race or, or mm-hmm. uh, face or whomever. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful city, and I'm more than honored to have the position. And, yeah, very big, very intimidating at first. Still very intimidating. It's big. So, um, but what I thought I was d- done writing tickets for junkyards from when <laughs> I left the township. <laughs> but now it's like, oh, gosh, now there's just many, many more of them. <sighs> and some of these seem to be the size of the township. They're so big. Yeah. It's fascinating what human nature does, isn't it? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and now, so now, to bring it around full circle, now somehow, sometime, one time, your daughter and child number two and three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nope. You know? <laughs> Never <laughs> say <laughs> nope. <laughs> My wife would have been looking at me with all five fingers in the air going, Fuck. <laughs> you know? But I, I think, you know, that it, it, if your life began um, when you got out, when, when you when the life began with the gentleman with the suitcase, you mm-hmm. know, the briefcase, whatever, you know, I mean, okay, if this is where Ron Youngblood's life actually did start, I mean, you know, you got kind of a delayed start there for about a decade mm-hmm. or so. But I mean, this you're the the story that people love to hear, you know. I mean, good boy goes bad goes good, you know, mm-hmm. and and it's like you're everything that that a Hallmark movie around Christmas is all about, you know. But so now trajectory straight up. So now what do you do? Okay, you got twenty twenty two coming up. You got the baby coming up. So now what does she get to hear? You know, when she sees those letters and stuff like that, you know, now what do you explain to her? Exactly what you explained to us today. How could she not be proud? Well, I might just wing it like today's interview. We just start and see how it goes. Um, no, I actually, I actually stored all my documents in a, in a little brown box. And I said, this box yeah. shouldn't be open until somebody wants to open it and know part of somebody's past. The man inside this box is dead. And that's not who this man is today. And my names are all over it. I folded every document I had with the federal government, and I left it in that box. Um, so one day she'll dig through, the, hopefully not this attic, another home, and, and dig through it because it's getting kind of small. The bigger she gets, the smaller it's going to get. It's only six hundred fifty square foot house. And mm. when she finds it, if she wants to read, but you know, I, I'm going to be open and honest from the start. You know, if she starts to have hear things in her peer group. We're going to have a conversation about that. The, you know, if she starts, if she's got a friend's relative, she's at a friend's house, and there's a conversation about something that's not, that, that resembles that old walk, then we're going to have a conversation. Um, I'm not going to hide my past from her or anybody else because I think it's a story, it's a testimony to what love can actually, what love and hard work can do for you if you just mm-hmm. do it. Um, so I think I'd want her to know. Once she starts to hit an age of understanding and seeing difference, and that she's got somebody telling her difference, I think is when we'll, we'll slowly start to introduce that talk. But if I'm long dead and gone and she finds the box and we just don't have the chance to, she'll find it and she'll know that that's her dad's handwriting. And he said that man's dead, and hopefully she'll believe me that that man was dead, that her daddy was a good guy and did his best. Yeah, because I was going to say, I mean, in, in the back of your mind, do you have like a predestined year to tell her, hey, you know what, <laughs> it was kind of kooky, dad, back in the day. You know, and so I want you to hear it from me before you hear it or see it somewhere else. Or just let it ride, you know. Yeah, and if that yeah. day comes up, it comes up. No, I mean, it'll. I'm going to make sure somehow, some way it comes up. Um, it's not like I, I haven't had a whole lot of time to sit around and think about it. <laughs> um, not for I mean, three months, no. You know, yeah, I, I should tell her now. That way she could say, you never <laughs> told me. I said, nope, here we are. On your fourth month birthday. Member? Month, yeah. <laughs> I told you, you can't say I didn't. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we got the video. <laughs> yep, yep, here you are, slobbering all over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it, there, there'll be a news story, a law broken, something that'll affect her or she'll see, and she'll express an emotion or a judgment, and that'll be an opening to say, hey, you know, yeah, they did that, but maybe they can become a good person, or... That, you're, that happened to your friend. We need to go comfort your friend. Not that the perpetrator, but the victim. There, there'll be a way where it'll just be, and that's one thing I've noticed in life, is if I just withdraw a little bit and just wait and breathe. The situations tend to happen when they need to happen, and it, it all presents itself when it's meant to be presented. Ta-da. All right, man, we got one minute to go. What didn't we talk about? Oh, uh, well, we touched on quite a bit. Has that been almost an hour already? No, oh, past. Oh, wow. Um, love's the only way, man. I think I, I don't know how to reiterate that. Love is love's the only way, and love's an action. It's not necessarily an emotion. 
it's being kind to people. And we're getting on a Christmas season where life's crazy with COVID and people that are still struggling. Mm -hmm. Love somebody. No matter what they look like, who they sleep with, what God they worship, show somebody love. Give them a blanket if they're cold. Give them some food if they're hungry. Those things, if I could just walk the world and do that, still have my family. And it didn't, wouldn't take much money. The peace I'd get from just showing love, that was the peace I've ultimately needed that I sought in other directions that never came. Or, or led to stupid stupid paths. You know, very dumb. Seeking a peace by going off and doing something dumb don't work. But seeking peace by being loving and being kind always works. You know, it always works. It worked for me, and it's a it's a thing that I do I, I do daily. I had a guy fill up my air in my tires today. He said it was five bucks. I thought it was a little crazy. I thought about the holiday. I thought about a struggling business. I gave him the five bucks to to do the air. And then when he found out who I was with the city, he wanted to give me the money back, and I refused it. <laughs> <laughs> Funny they how had that a great worked out. Business. Great guys. I won't take anything from them. Um, of course, you know, there are people that do, and it's not me. Um, there's a lot less that do that now because they've been weeded out, and mm -hmm. the city should be proud of the people that, that have working for them. Um, but, no, they kept their five bucks, and I was more than glad to give it. I was more than glad to give him more than he wanted. It didn't bother me none. The business did a little better today. Um, yeah, I could go on and on about love and just, being kind and doing the right thing, John, but I'm glad I was able to spend that last minute saying something about love. Job well done. Anybody we didn't thank? Oh. Uh, All right, another hour? <laughs> no. My buddy Terrence. Yeah, okay. He's been uh city of Detroit, the state of Michigan for and then thank the uh I'm gonna thank Agent Harmon, who really scared the shit out of me during interrogations. <laughs> You know, just with the truth, I won't mention my attorney's name, but maybe he'll get more business, but he was great. Um, there's a lot of people I want to thank, and it would take another hour to really okay. thank and just be thankful and grateful. Well, I think you wrapped it up very nicely, especially in this holiday season where, I mean, it, people should slow down a little bit more. Yeah, we're pretty hectic around March and April, but there's something about getting close to Christmas. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, just take a little time. There you go. Ryan Youngblood, thanks a lot for being with us, my good man. Always, John, anytime. Hang on the line. We'll get, we want to talk to you for just a little bit. But right now, the tremolos, here comes my baby, here on the home of high performance hits of the 60s and 70s, CKIW. <laughs> Hi, Radio 76.